It's with Jared Hall and Red Bulls. All right. <laughs> hey, by the way, if you don't have one of these cards yet, get one from Noisy to come in, okay? Because I do some drawings and some giveaways and some other cool things like that, which is a lot of fun. Hey, thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me out here to Layer 1. Let's have a little fun today. Want to? So, yeah, he's already like psyched. Okay. Well, here's what I got. I got some like cool swag up here that I give away. Usually give it away if you got a right answer for a question I ask. Also, I'll give it away just on random drawings. And so I'll give you one random drawing real quick. Here's my random number generator. Okay, my little uh, sort of reverse high school money roll where I put all the ones on the outside so you don't get rolled. And the problem is, so I just grabbed the last two digits. And the problem is, of course, I know that we haven't gotten the large ones out yet, so we'll grab this one. Who's got uh, winning number 016? Is that you? All right, what would you like? You like stuff from NSA? Sure. Sure, I'll tell you what. Okay, you're now enlisted. Here's NSA. Dog tag, welcome. Let's get going. Let's get started. Okay, my name's G Mark. I want to talk to you about a hacker who looks at 50. There's only one problem about this talk. It got me in trouble this week. You know, as you get a little bit older, you get involved in different things, and you get invited to places. On Tuesday, I was invited to go testify before the United States Senate to their Entrepreneurial and Small Business Council. It was run by Senator Kerry. And I had sent my information into them, and they said, great. And then I got a call back. I said, hi, um, this is Karen from Senator Kerry's office. So we're just researching you on the Internet, and it says here that you're a hacker. That could be a problem. Wait a minute. Okay, refresh your screen. See, <laughs> I'm not a hacker. That's not a problem. <laughs> so what happens is a lot of us are getting misunderstood, and we want to talk about what it was like in the early days. Back in the 1970s, when I first started learning about computers, working with systems that fundamentally give us the same challenges we have today, but they operated at a lot slower speed. And we didn't have the communications, we didn't have the bandwidth that was out there. So this is before the Internet. No Internet available. No email. Sounds great, right? <laughs> no cell phones. All right. No PCs. No 802.11 anything. I think it was down around 202.11 as they were still working on the standards back then. But what we did have is an opportunity to work on the, on the mainframes. And so back at high school, I went to Amherst High School outside of uh, Buffalo, New York. And Buffalo's a great place. We've got two seasons there, winter and the 4th of July. So if you, if you miss it, you come back the next year, you can catch the sun. But sophomore year, I got in there, and they had these two computer terminals in there, and they were IBM 2741s. Anybody ever heard of that term or know what that thing is? Yeah, it's a giant selectric typewriter parked on a box of about 50 pounds of electronic gear. And what it does is we have then a phone with an acoustic coupler. You dial the number, push the button, beep, put the phone in there, and you got a 300 baud connection to the mainframe, and you're rocking. Well, the problem is these things came without any directions. There were no classes. There were no courses. There, they were just, there you are. Go figure it out. Well, isn't that really what we're all about, trying to figure things out, challenge of academic pursuit of knowledge, finding things that we want to know how they work. So it wasn't too bad, except for the fact that, anybody ever heard of APL? Yes. A programming language? What do you know about APL? No, that's all. That's all you know. He knows that it's APL. Okay. APL is a totally symbolic programming language. It was actually developed as a mathematical notation back in the 1960s by a guy by the name of Dr. Ken Iverson at IBM. And uh, so you know, back then we loved APL and we thought it was pretty neat, but it was a write-only language. Because once you wrote code, you could never figure out what you wrote. Because the whole uppercase were not letters, they were symbols. And so what you did is you tried to pack as much things as you can in one line because it was an interpreted language. And you could do amazing things. I did Conway's Game of Life in one line. Okay, it was 254 characters, but you could squeeze all this stuff in there. And you did other cool things like that. But the hard part was, is of course, how do we go ahead and make this thing work to do stuff beyond just the basic academics. You know, you couldn't use it for school, you couldn't use it for, for any of the program. I can handle it. We can edit this out, right? Yeah, yeah, this is yeah, we'll do the voiceover. Do the Millie Vanilli. I we got with my head not working up in problem here. Anyway. So all right, we need some more drawings. More people coming in. Hello, getting cards as you walk in the door? All right. Who's got number 002? Uh, who was here early? Yeah, over there. You were here early. You like shirts? 
Are you not the Fed? There you go. Okay, so given a bunch of computers where you got things hooked up, and you're trying to figure out how does it make all this thing work together, we start exploring it and we start trying to get into the systems. After a while, we write programs, we write uh, applications, but of course, who wants to just stop there? It's a closed system, there's not a whole lot of damage you can do, but we we're exploring around trying to figure out what was in there, and it turned out that uh, there are certain functions that were in there. They mentioned all these little shift characters you could do. Well, one of them that was called I-beams. And what I-beam was is you had one character and you backspaced over and you created another one, and then you could get system information. Like I-beam 29 was your user ID. Pretty cool. Or you could also get another I-beam, which would tell you the total minutes of connect time, or actually like hundreds of a second, and the total CPU processing time and things like that. Well, one day, one of the guys came in and they said, hey, I found a journal that had an IBA APL program in it, and it had a dyadic I-beam, like something on the left, something on the right. It's like, well, what the heck is that? Well, we've never seen those before. We went ahead, we tried typing in, and sure enough, those are system control functions. You could now change the, your origin. You could change your random number seed. You could start changing stuff. And we thought, well, this is pretty cool. I wonder what else you can change. So we start trying all the permutations, and we kind of bump into the walls, and of course you figure out there's just so far you can get as a user. Well, in an APL environment, you got 32K of memory, and that was to store your program and to execute your program. And that seemed like a lot of the time. We'd store all kinds of stuff, but we'd put everything in there, we'd cram it in there, we thought, like Bill Gates, 640K, who's ever going to need any more? <laughs> that was what 32K was the standard back in the 1970s, and we thought that was great. But there's one thing we always wanted to do, and which, of course, everybody wants to do, is that's become root. Well, how do you become root in a system like that? Turns out you have to log in as a system operator because every day you log in, there's an operator there and his little broadcast message. And we'd be trying to socially engineer the operator, but this guy, it wasn't a fully attended terminal, occasionally do stuff, but it wasn't too bad. But there was one thing that we had. You couldn't go in there. You couldn't go ahead and build a, a root kit. You couldn't develop tools. But in high school, you have what? Field trips. And we had a field trip all the way out to where the computing center was, way out by the airport. We thought, oh, this is pretty cool. So a couple of us who kind of figured out that, hey, this would be neat to be a system operator, and we came along the field trip, we're kind of walking around, looking at the, the tapes and the drum memory and, and the IBM 370. Okay, we're doing pretty well. 360 was the original, but the 370, at least this with the table, huge, phenomenal amount of air conditioning coming through there, and the, big, the way they did authentication is what? You had to have a white lab coat with four different colored pens to get in and out of the door. And that's how you controlled the data flow. If you didn't wear one of those, then you were obviously a visitor, and then you were watched. So we got in there, and we're looking around, and we're looking at all this stuff, and it's like, there's a console. Okay, well, these old consoles did what? They printed out an old fan fold paper, chum, 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 just fall down there. So what we wanted to do is say, okay, you go distract the tour guides, and we'll come over here, and we'll kind of look through the fan fold and find it. And like, there it is. Found the system operator ID and password. All the IDs were numeric. And so I'm looking, it's like, okay, trying to remember, it's like, it's, it's six digit number, it's three. 14, 15, 9, 3, 14, 15, 9, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 9. Starting to sound familiar? The root ID and the APL systems was pi. But it also had the password there because it was a mass. It's like, okay, we got it. So now the adrenaline's going, right? You have a chance, but you've got to finish the field trip. You've got to get back in line, look at this, pretend to be fascinated, pretend to be interested. So we get back to school, and the first thing we do is, hey, everybody's gone. Let's log in, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 9, enter the password. Number in use because you can have only one operator at a time. All right, that's reasonable policy, I suppose. So now we created what kind of a problem that we have in the morning. Something you deal with today when you're, when you're uh, looking at it, building code. Race condition, right. You've got to go ahead and you have to log in before the operator does. The problem is when they start up the machine, usually by the time you got into school, the system's up and running. But one morning we got in early. All right, that was good. So we logged in, 314159, entered in the password. And it took. And it's like, okay, we've got it. We're in. But there's only one problem. When your system operator console, that console is expected to receive messages all day long. It's not for interaction. So the keyboard stays locked until you hit, like an escape key or the attention key, which then frees up the, the cursor. So we're sitting there. We're looking at it. It's like, it's not doing anything. We're in. We're not doing anything. Of course, meanwhile, system operator gets number in use, boots us off the system, changes the password. Now we're back to ground zero again. So lather, rinse, repeat, another field trip, another opportunity, and we get a second shot at it. This time, 
you figure, okay, we need a better strategy. How are we going to do this? Well, okay, we need to understand how these system commands work. They're all privileged. They've got to be based on something. So one of my buddies who was a year older, he was a junior, Ray Clark. Ray was an neat guy, and Ray said, hey, he'd do anything. He's a nice guy. So he said, hey, I'll go down to IBM downtown Buffalo because I'll get the, AP, the APL manual because we've got a catalog of all the, all the books. And by the way, if you have your little cards here, if you figure out what this job deck is, if you start comparing them, it's a catalog of publications. This is from Mom's Attic. All right, this is a job deck that I stuck up there in 1974. If you smell the cards, go ahead. Smell that? That's Mom's Attic. I just picked these things up three days ago. I was back in Buffalo. IBM System 360 Disk Operating System American National Standard COBOL. IBM SRL Bibliography Supplement Teleprocessing and Data Collection. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting stuff there. Of course, this is all this is what I call a dead deck, but it was it was still potentially useful. So, anyway, we got this catalog of IBM manuals, and one of them was licensed materials, like the System Operator Manual for APL. It's like we got to get that thing. The only one problem is we call up IBM and say you order it, so you can't order it. So why not? Well, it's a licensed publication. You can only be checked out, like, a, like the reference section of a library, but you're not really allowed to have it, unless you already own an IBM 370. Do you have one? Um, I don't know. How much you got? No, we, we, we can't afford to buy one. So anyway, Ray, Ray says, don't worry about it. I'll go down. So he gets his bicycle, rides down the Buffalo, goes up and bangs on the door at IBM, and says, oh, he says, I need a copy of this manual. It's the IBM reference manual. He says, well, we're not allowed to give it to you. He says, well, I want one. Well, we're not allowed to. He says, I need to talk to somebody. So let me talk to Ken Iverson. Remember Dr. Iverson? The guy? He's out in Armonk, New York, and this guy's enshrined like one of these great gurus. So he keeps pushing the guy. So they call over to Armonk. They you know, get a hold of Dr. Iverson. He's in some big staff meeting, and they go, what is it? And he said, there's some kid here who wants a copy of the manual. Damn it, just give him the manual. Click. <laughs> so Ray comes back with the Holy Grail. And we start looking through this thing, and we go, okay, fine, here, okay, you can privilege accounts, you can add accounts, you can add workspaces, you can change, oh, all this cool stuff, like you might expect. Of course, the hard part is you can't run the privilege commands unless you're the operator. And the only way you get to be the operator is to get in, but if you could privilege somebody else, maybe, and we had two terminals, you could log the one as an operator, you log in as you, I'll quick privilege you, then log back out as an operator, and now we've got a privilege machine. That works. You have the race condition that you satisfied, and then you're also able to go ahead and what? Shift your access port. So now, unless they happen to run a special command that shows who's the system users, we're in. The problem is, you can't just trust that to anybody else in the high school. Someone's got root on the system, they can oh, delete star dot star, everything's gone. So what are you going to do with it? You've got to like... I gotta go to social studies class, but I don't want to go to social. I want to. I want to own the system, but you can't. So you gotta like <laughs> log off. Okay, we'll try again. Of course, it's just so difficult to get there. So then we had to figure out something else. We already said, hey, we heard about this dyadic IBM thing. It controls system functions. Guess what? It also controls all the privileged functions as well. All right, this is pretty cool. Here's one that creates a privileged user. So what do you do with it? You can't run it. Only the operator can. But you can't get in as the operator because he's already logged in. So what do you create? Come on. Not a virus. You couldn't do viruses back then. But you could do Trojan horses. He could write something that says, hey, we got this really cool tic-tac-toe game. Remember, this is all text. Log in. We kept trying to go with the operator. Hey, play our game. Play this thing. And you know, we'd lock up the code so you could go ahead and see what it was. And uh, we worked on it. And so anyway, we kept working on these little things. And, and you started exploring the boundaries. Well, back then... You figured, okay, you got 32K workspace. You're logging in with all the other high schools. You send messages back and forth, kind of the equivalent of texting somebody now. But it was all on that system. You had to be on the console. But, of course, you want more. You always want more, right? So we figured, okay, what else is there out there? Well, it turns out that there was a couple timeshare systems that were also available in the state of New York. And they were, because we saw those at different exhibitions and things like that, but we wanted to get a chance to log in because we heard about this one in Binghamton or Poughkeepsie, New York, or someplace you know, way off in the east, someplace we'd never been to before. And uh, <laughs> you don't get out much, do you? <laughs> you don't in Poughkeepsie. We, I feel sorry for the guy. Should we give him something? <laughs> I don't know. There we go. Closet geek. 
These are some of the things that Jinx had donated. You can pick this up now or later. It'll be here waiting for you. Relax. It's probably contagious. We'll have someone bring it to you. So anyway, we're going ahead. We're trying to figure out, like, how do we get in there? Well, the problem was how to get the communications because you have this phone system. You dial it and you dial 9 and you get rapid busy. You're not allowed to get out. And they certified students can't get out on these phone systems. So, of course, we dialed 5 and it got you the tone. If you dialed 1 or, you know, other numbers didn't work. But if you dialed 8, you got this weird dial tone. Hmm. It's not a, then, you, then you try dial home or whatever. It didn't work because it would just kind of click out. Well, what do you do when you encounter a new access system and you're not sure, you're sure what numbers are going to work? <laughs> Try them all, which is called? Brute force. Brute force. All right. Who's our NSA brute force guy? You already had something out there, right? I said, I said it too. All right. You fight over it. <laughs> all right. Well, you've got you to make something else up. We'll, we'll draw a dollar bill for it. So you brute force him. So you trial one. Nothing happens. One, one. Still nothing happens. One, 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 click. Ooh, it's a three-digit sequence. That's why we weren't getting it, because how many people's phone numbers begin with one? Or one, one. One, one, two, one, one, three, one. We tried it down, and I got like about one, two, seven. to get... Ooh, ooh, style tone. So I remember we were mapping these things all out, and we had a whole bunch of numbers that seemed to work. And some of those things would then allow you to dial nine from there and then get an outside line. So now you're going through your local number into the New York tie line system into some access point somewhere in some other part of the New York state through an outside line then dialing over to the system. Hey, you know, who's ever going to catch that? <laughs> so we thought we were doing pretty well. But back then, people said, well, y'all, 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 aren't you breaking the law? Well, there were no laws. Really, there weren't. The only law out there was kind of the hacker ethic, which said basically, don't do any damage, don't take anything that doesn't belong to you. Very, very different than what we see today in terms of behavior, but we're very sincere about that. And this one system, which is a Seco system on Poughkeepsie, New York, because we had a chance to use it over the summer when we did a uh, exhibition at the Erie County Fair, had user IDs that were four digits, and most of them ended in 00 or 01. So how tough is that to brute force? But once you got in, you found out the timeshare system would bill you for connect time, it'd bill you for CPU time, and that was probably somebody's real money. Well, if you bill somebody else for your connect time, you're violating the prime directive, right? So how do you get out of that? And it turns out that they rebooted that system every night, they shut it down, they ran their accounting at about 6 o'clock at night. And because of the timeshare system, they would issue a command to say, okay, everybody log off and we're going to bounce you off the system in five minutes. And it turned out that is when he issued the bounce command, you would get bounced off as soon as you got control back at the console. Or if a program was running, it would interrupt the program and bounce you off. And we would figure, okay, well, is it, how do you extend that? How do you keep on even though that won't work? So we're trying different things. Every night you're in there, okay, let's try running this big, complicated line one, go to one. And it kicks you right out. So that didn't work. And you try typing in a long message, but while you're typing, it goes, ah, you're bounced out. But it turned out, if you type a really long line, it can't bounce. We always noticed it never interrupted you in the middle of the line. It was always waited to the end of the line. What's the longest line you can output in a 32K system? 32,768 uh, ASCII characters. Or what if you're using binary, 0 and 1? Well, they only took one bit. So now you get 262,144 zeros or ones. And how long does that take to print on a line? long time. Well, back then they had the old type balls where you had this little round thing with all the keys and you'd take the type ball off so you wouldn't waste all the paper. Because we were running paper forward, back, up, down, left, right, because we were very resource constrained. So you'd wait till the guy says, he's bouncing the system. Okay, it's about three minutes to six. All right, 200,000 zeros. Take off the type ball, hit enter. And you're and it's going, it's going. You realize like the last bus that leaves at 6 o'clock from the front of the school, and otherwise you've got to walk home in the snow. And, you go, and finally the operator has bounced everybody else's system except off for you, and he gives up, and he just shuts down the system, at which point it just stops, power it off, run out the door, chase the bus down the driveway, and get home in time for late dinner. Or any dinner at all. I mean, it was six of us, and so if you didn't get home on time, you probably didn't eat. But I ate a lot of peanut butter and jelly. Um, but the cool thing was, it reset, it, it never could log in the accounting data from that session because the session was interrupted, it was not wrapped up. 
And so we were then able to access other systems and literally make sure no one else got billed. I, again, the only usage is electricity. Of course, today all this stuff would not fall within the legal framework. But in 1974, people weren't thinking the way we were thinking. It's kind of like the, the, you know, the, the, the leading edge on this stuff. And the other interesting thing we found out is that we wonder, okay, well, we all had different user IDs. We figured out, you know, we knew that Amherst High School began with, there were eight-digit numbers, okay, kind of tough to guess an eight-digit number. But they all began with 16504. And then we had three public user IDs, 909, 061, 901. Don't ask me why I still remember them, but I do. And like Amherst Junior High School was 16525, and then Hamburg was 104. I didn't find out until years later that five-digit sequence was the New York State five-digit code for that particular high school. Well, one day at time I was in there, I think it was like a Saturday, I mean, kind of lubed in that computer room. See, back then, being a geek wasn't cool. Today it is a little bit more, but eh, nobody really related to you, then, essentially. So you're in there on a Saturday, you're in there nights, evenings, weekends, playing with stuff. And said, hey, let me generate a random string of 1,000, question mark 1,000. That says, give me 1,000 random numbers from 1 to 1,000. And I print it, and I start looking through the list, and I see 909-61-901. I said, what's the next one? Yeah, so I don't forget what you know, like that. Something else. So I try to log in 16504, dit, 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 and I'm in. Ooh, onto something. Log out, log, try the next one. It says uh, number locked. See, back then we didn't really have good things. If you had the right ID, ID but the wrong password, it would kind of give you a clue. It says, you got the number that works, but the number is locked. Today, of course, you don't want to tell somebody, says, hey, you're getting close. <laughs> <laughs> you're getting warm. Uh, try, uh, try something else here. Change that fourth character. You might get in. So all of a sudden, Wait a minute. So if that's this, and there's, well, if we have 50 IDs, 16504, 16525, and then we jump down to the next kind of batch in that list, that, 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 and it works. And all of a sudden, we've got all the user numbers for every high school in western New York. And that's kind of a thrill there, right? That little bit of adrenaline rush. And right then, Mr. Berg walks in, the computer teacher. As like, how you doing, Mark? It's like, whoa! <laughs> Pull out all this, you know, cover. Oh, nothing, nothing to look at here. Uh, move along, move along. And I was like hyperventilating. It's like, oh, we're going to lose this, and we just found it. And of course, you find out that back then, a lot of these security that we thought were secure really weren't secure. What, how, what's the security in pseudo random numbers? Not much. Anybody ever try to do web crack or anything like that? Or you look at your IP? Lots of things we look at today, we find out that there's some poor assumptions that are put into security that still carry forward. So anyway, we, you're like, okay. This, this computer is cool. It's pretty neat. But we need more. <laughs> so right about then, there was an opportunity that came out. 1975, in the January issue of Popular Electronics, guess what was featured on the cover? Really the first personal computer you could build and buy, called the Altair 8800. You've probably heard of the Altair 8800. It's in the Smithsonian. <laughs> one of them is anyway. I don't think it's the one we built, but we built one. We ordered it. So we got the kids together, and it was a lot of money, like 380 bucks. Now back then, I worked a paper route that paid 1.8 cents per daily delivery and 5.6 cents for a Sunday. So you scrape all that money together, and maybe you get a few bucks at the end of the week. So $300 was a fortune. But we pooled about 10 or 12 of us together, and we got the money together, and we found a comp an advisor, and we formed this club, and so we started working on it. So we ordered it, and the thing shows up in the mail. <laughs> All right, this is great. We open it up. Guess what's in the box? Parts. Parts. <laughs> Some assembly required. <laughs> a lot of assembly required. <laughs> it's got circuit boards, okay. Resistors. <laughs> Diodes. Capacitors. Um, wire. You know, there's no bus on there or anything like that. This LEDs, the front panel. It's like, holy mackerel, and you like gotta build this whole thing. So I and like one chip. Nothing else is automated, just that one CPU. Everything else is all done in old style electronics. Well, okay, fine. So we'll give it a shot. So off we go. So we we divvy this thing up and we take home a board and we you know solder this thing on there or you go, okay, silver, orange, green you, after a while you finally learn what all those those bands are in a resistor kind of a lost art. It's like being able to use a slide rule, <laughs> which we had to use back then because there weren't any pocket calculators. Actually, I did get one. Dad bought me one. I think it was in 10th grade for chemistry. It was a plus minus times divide. Took six AA cell batteries and it was $100 in 1973. 
Pardon? What's that, the Bomar brain? The Bomar brain. I don't even remember what the name of that thing was. That was the first one. Yeah, I remember my friend Howard Hall had a cool one with the numbers. They hadn't standardized yet on how the LEDs would be straight lines, so this had curved things. It was like really weird to look at because the six came down and back and around. It looked like some little symbol from the occult. So we had these things. So we started building it. And you put the board together and, okay, fine. Then you pass it on to the next guy who would inspect it to make sure you didn't have any cold solder joints, you didn't roast any components, or you missed something. And you got the right things in the right place. And this took about three months. Because you know, you're still going to school and you're doing your after-school activities and things like that. And then you've got to babysit for little brothers and sisters. Um, I learned to wake up like this from my mom. She didn't know, realize it at the time. But I was the eldest of six. And, you know, you stay up late doing stuff like that. So you come home from school. And what do you want to do? You know, I'll, you know, take a little nap for a little bit. Hey, Mark. Huh, what? You going know, to babysit the kids tonight? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Fine. And then you get ready to go out the door. And you like that. Where are you going? Well, I'm going out with my buddies. No, you're not. You're babysitting. What do you mean? You, you promised you baby. Oh, yeah. So now the phone rings 2 in the morning. Wake in about two seconds. Very useful. Anyway, we got all these boards. We put them together and say, all right, it's showtime. Well, the oldest guy in our group was Tom Richmond. Tom was a senior. That was kind of big. And, and Tom ended up going on to Brown. He ended up getting his master's in, at Northwestern and did really well. So we went over to his house. We went down to the basement, and we assembled this whole thing in there on his ping pong table in his mom's house. And then we got ready to put in the one chip. The big, was it a Z80? I'm trying to remember. Z80 chip. Well, what we didn't want to do is we didn't want to, you know, because it's warning, static charge might destroy chip. So we can't afford that. So we took a big piece of copper wire, we tied it around Tom's wrist, we tied the other end of the drain pipe at the basement. <laughs> okay, this guy's not going anywhere. Okay, he's, he's part of a circuit. And he takes the thing out, and he ever so carefully puts it right into the socket. And we all step back, we hold our breath, and we turn it on. And it doesn't work. <laughs> it's got about three lights that are going. Mm. <laughs> and I go, oh no! I mean, it could be any of a thousand little solder joints, the tiniest there, or something in backwards reverse. And we're just in a total despair at this point. We just wander around like, oh, what are we going to do? Well, anyway, little Billy Richmond, who's still in junior high school, a little roly-poly kid with big curly hair, he comes down and says, "Hey, kids, where are you guys? What are you doing down here?" And he walks over and looks at us and says. Hey, that big thing isn't pushed in. Let me put it in. And he reaches in with his thumb to push the chip in. And of course, we're all we're like, no! <laughs> and that was a problem. The chip wasn't seated. It worked perfectly after that. So Billy lived. <laughs> so we, we've, we've got this computer, and we start saying, okay, what are we going to do with it? Well, the only way you could program the old Altair was with the switches on the front. 0110010 load, 0010000 load, 1010100. It took a long time to get a program in. And then you'd run the thing, and, it, and then the light pattern would end up, and you'd have to decipher the code, because it was octal, base 8. You write down, the, and then you do the answer. Okay, well, that was pretty cool, but that's kind of primitive. We need something more. We had some sharp guys in there. We had one kid, I think his name was Mark Merritt. He ended up the next year winning the Junior Achievement Invention of the Year Award nationally for coming up with a 99 cent circuit tester, which is basically neon bulb, two wires, put in a test tube, pour in a little stuff that hardens into like white crystal, and off you went. Well, anyway, he said, hey, let's build a little interface. So he built from a little touchstone pad and a three character LED display a keyboard and a display so we could go 137, 212, 13. And now we can also you can program in there and you can run it and you can get the display right back out. That was pretty cool. For those of us who were not, weren't so hardware-minded, the software guys, we were writing a basic interpreter or a compiler. So I was doing the long divide routines. I, I do some of the, you know, the, the, the short straws trying to go do the tough stuff. And we were writing all this stuff. We only had about 4K to work with. But we built all this stuff, and we got it working. We got the basic running and everything like that. Now, what's happening at the same time? 1975, a guy by the name of Bill Gates looks at the Altair and says, Microsoft. And the guy by the name of Steve Jobs looks at it with his buddy Waz, and he goes, Apple. And we looked at it, and we said, let's take it to a school assembly and make it play music. <laughs> because if you took a little AM radio and you put it next to the CPU and you ran a certain series of no-ops, 
it would go, you, you could make it play a song. Oh, do, de, do, 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 de, do, do. And that was our highest achievement. We made it play music at a school assembly. And what we didn't realize is at the time we had Microsoft and we had Apple in the palms of our hands. But none of us had the vision to know what to do with it. So, you know, none of us got incredibly wealthy out of that. So that's life. I mean, I'm not bitter about it or anything. <laughs> but, but it does show the importance of vision and why it's important to be able to look ahead and have some idea of what you want to do. Because you can have tremendous opportunities in front of you and not know what they are. And there's also a real danger of being, way at, you know, being too far ahead of the, the curve. You know, if you're one step ahead of everybody else, what do they call you? A consultant, right? If you're two steps ahead, you're a visionary. And if you're three steps ahead, you're a prophet. And if you're four or more, you're a lunatic. Because you're so far out there that people aren't going to accept what you've got to say because they don't believe that it's valid, they don't believe that it's true. So you've got to be careful to stay grounded where everybody else is coming from, from a reference point. Because otherwise, what it is that you say, what it is that you believe, what it is you try to convey in terms of ideas just won't work. And that's a little bit tough. So between building the altar, working on this APL, riding my bicycle down to the University of Buffalo and running punch card decks through their things, I found I was helping college guys do their homework with the Fortran and their Pascal. And I said, I'm learning these stuff. And I said, well, let me take a look at, oh, this is, da, da, da. now here's this like, 16-year-old kid who came, I don't have to drive at the time, riding down there and, and doing, if you will, advisory work for all the college guys. But you got computing any way you could find it. So anyway, senior year comes up, and at the end of senior year, I have an opportunity because all these computers are run in the state of New York through something called the Board of Cooperative Educational Services, or BOCES. Anybody ever went to school in New York probably remembers that, that acronym. And they run the tech schools and things like that. So one, th one student per year from all 32 high schools got hired that summer to work at BOCES. And it was kind of like a work-study job, but it was, it was real work. And back then, any type of work was pretty good. Two years earlier, the guy was from our high school, Peter Gable, who was president of our computer club. He went on to MIT and then was one of the founding members of a little company called Lotus. And then he started Arity Prolog Corporation, and he'd he done quite well. So I figured, hey, I'd like to do this. So I, I, I get a hold of my uh, computer science advisor or computer club advisor, and I say, hey, Mr. Berg, I'd like to, I'd like to see these people about this job. And I say, well, <laughs> that's kind of funny, Mark. They want to see you. Ooh, remember all those phone calls? Remember all that stuff we thought no one was noticing? Well, yeah, they kind of noticed. So I went over the job interview, and they said, well, what's your background? Well, I said, yeah, we did, 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 did. But they could tell that there, was no, there wasn't any maliciousness there. It was just, hey, it's an academic, it's an intellectual challenge, just go figure it out. He said, well, what do you want to do? I said, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and probably make everybody in Western New York hate me because here's a plan. We're going to change all the IDs from seven to eight characters. So we've got four random numbers at the end. It's not going to be the same pseudo-random sequence. We're going to go back, da, da, da. And, okay. So I got a job working at $2.10 an hour at 40 hours a week for the state of New York. And that was actually below minimum wage because 2 30 was the minimum wage. And I know that because I worked a night job at the corner grocery store three nights a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, or something like that, as a night manager. So I would average a 63-hour work week and would take home about 100 bucks. I think 9,802 after tax, whoever it was. That's nothing. But back then, it was great because in the mid-70s in Buffalo, Bethlehem Steel Plant shut down. Bell Aerospace shut down. Ford shut down. All the plants shut down. Nobody had any work. Unemployment was up around 20-some-odd percent. It was like some third-world nation. And I remember Mark Simon, who was our valedictorian from our high school class, came by my store one evening and said, can I put this in the window? And he's got a little sign that says, uh, high, or college freshman willing to do any type of yard work, cheap. I mean, that's how desperate we were for money. So I thought I had it pretty good. And I was working there, and I also had a chance, an offer from the high school to write the curriculum for the computer science class for the next year. But I didn't have time. I mean, you're already working out 60, 63 hours a week. You're tapped out. So at that point, I figured, well, you know, what are you going to do? So get ready to head off for college. And I'm looking through different you know, card catalogs and things like that. One of the things I had wanted to do is, uh, you know, I thought it would be neat to go to someplace neat like MIT or whatever. Well, I didn't quite have the best grades in high school. I thought I was smart enough, but you learn early on in life there's a big difference between capability and achievement. Sometimes that gets worse as you get older. 
I think mine's actually gotten better at finally catching up. When I did my MBA 10 years ago, I graduated the top of my class. It was sort of like proof to say, see, I could have done it back then. But I was just proving it to myself. Doesn't help any. Doesn't get you paid any more in the work. Nobody cares. Nobody asked for your GPA at grad school. You know, even the undergraduate, like, well, what's your GPA? I don't care. They're not listening. Just trying to see if they can embarrass you or something like that. So anyway, I had uh, you know, get all of these things that come back and forth, and you apply for all these things, and got these things from ROTC. It's like, okay, fill them out, fill them out. Well, the Navy stuff come back fairly faster than the Army and the Air Force, and I, I wasn't quite sure about the Navy because I didn't learn to swim until I was, I don't know, like 13 or 14 years old, and I always watched the old World War II movies, guys abandoning ship when they get torpedoes. Like, no way. <laughs> I'm not getting one of those things. My dad used to tell me war stories about him in the Korean War, and he showed me all the numbers from the guys he had rescued behind enemy lines and the little bullet hole in his leg. And I found out later that that was from the lawnmower when he was a kid. <laughs> and he, did, he was at uh, a station in Pennsylvania during the war to encounter intelligence. But, you know, cool stuff. And so I applied for the scholarship. So I finally had to go in for this interview. And they do physical and things like that. You think I'm skinny now? I was 6'2", 131. In 1975, that's on my first official Navy physical. I think they put down, put him in a UNICEF poster, people will feel sorry for him. <laughs> so I had to sit down with this lieutenant for an interview. And it turned out that the lieutenant was the same guy who was at the Erie County Fair the summer before at the next booth. He was doing this little Navy recruiting thing and we're showing high school students using computers. And it's like, I know you. He's like, hey, how you doing? I remember you. It went really well. So I thought, okay, this is great, this is wonderful. So I put down, oh, I want to go to MIT. Okay. Well, anyway, it comes back and it says, well, you didn't get into MIT, sorry. And uh, you're on the alternate list for scholarships. Okay, well, no money, big family, living in Buffalo. Guess I'm going to be going to the University of Buffalo, riding the city bus into work or into school, paying $600 a year tuition. And then I get a letter around mid-February saying, congratulations, uh, you've just cleared the wait list. You get in a scholarship to Northwestern University. And I go, great, I never applied to Northwestern University. <laughs> so you quick get on the phone with admissions, and it's past the deadline now. And you go like, well, um, I, I've got a full scholarship from the Navy, but could you let me in? And they go, yeah, if, if, if you've made their scholarship, you'll make our standards. Basically saying, we know the checks will clear the bank, so you're in. <laughs> and uh, Northwestern's a pretty good school. They had one of the best chess programs out there. Oddly enough, I played our chess team in high school. I played first board. When I got to Northwestern, I had the best program in the world. I just stopped because there's something there that I hadn't really known about in high school at all. And it's called girls. Girls didn't play chess. They played bridge, so I started playing bridge. We did other things. Now, of course, now today it's, it's first-player shooter games, but <laughs> you adapt. And so that was pretty good, and I got a job there, and I was working for the school. And one of the things I was doing is they had a, kind of like a primitive version of APL up and running, and I was trying to look at how to convert things here like that. But I was in one evening, and I'm... Working on a computer, and you had to take certain classes. Anybody ever take COBOL? Yeah, we should buy. Yeah, I noticed everybody's taking COBOL is over the age of 30 here. Anybody still programming COBOL? No. What happened to all the COBOL programmers? They're back working at Burger King now that Y2K is over. Okay, you want fries with that? For a little while, you had like this little dream job. You come back, rescue the world from the two digit date codes, but they're back again. So I hated that code, and I did the least I could. But Pascal, some of these names, you know, Fortran, you hear these names, you know, they're, they're okay. Well, one evening I'm sitting there working on the computer, and I, uh, we're going to Pascal, I've already taken the course, and I go, huh, here's the manual. Amazing what you find when you read manuals. And it says, uh, files can have passwords, they can be locked, they can be controlled. And I said, none of these passwords, none of these compilers, none of these things have any passwords on them. I mean, it's like wide open. We've been working on this mainframe for years, and there's like no security. So guess what I thought it needed? A password. So I said, okay, well, let's see. Can I password protect it? Yeah, okay, well, unpassword protect it. That was fine. I wonder if you could do the rename command. So I renamed the Pascal compiler to the Fortran compiler, and I renamed the Fortran compiler to the Pascal compiler. <laughs> and again, I'm just experimenting. And, and not realizing that there's a huge project due in both classes the next day. So there's people lined up with their job decks in front of these big machines at all the student university places. And the guy puts in his Pascal deck, chung, 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 and it comes out with Fortran compilers. <laughs> and the guys are the four, and people are going nuts everywhere, and they're panicking. And I'm just sitting there in the quiet little back room because I'm using one of these newfangled things called a CRT. Because I'm not doing jobs. I'm like this live interface. It's supposed to be the way of the future. Typing away. It's like, 
Oh, okay, well, I put them back. And I said, well, I guess they should be password protected. So I password protected them, and I decided that, okay, I'll go home. <laughs> As I'm walking out of this back room through the computing center, this guy comes banging out one of the doors. He comes racing down the hall. He goes, my God, they've got the Pascal compiler, too. They're everywhere. And I'm thinking that little line from Top Gun, not good, not good. <laughs> And so I, I follow the guy already goes into the main computer room. The holy of holies, you're never allowed in there unless you got the lab coat with four color pens. But I like follow him in anyway because I'm on the computing staff. I'm making five bucks an hour, three bucks an hour, something dirt cheap. And it's like, what's the problem? Go away, kid, you bother me. He says, well, I, I know what's going on. I said, well, I, like, I did it. He says, you did what? <laughs> it's like, no, no, please, time out. He says, look, look I, was, I, was, I work on the staff. I work here. Well, you're going to have to answer the boss for this. You know, not again. So unpassword protected and put it back where they were. The next morning, sitting down with the director of computing from Northwestern University in front of like big long table. All right, Mark, what happened? Well, I explained to him what I was doing and, and the reason for it. He says, "Yeah, good catch. Um, sorry that it went that way that it did, but you're right. We do need to improve our security on this." He was pretty cool about it because again. If you weren't doing it to be mean, if you weren't doing it to be malicious, we're just kind of experimenting. But it just shows you the, the danger. It's like chemistry. A little bit of knowledge is dangerous. You can blow yourself up. And so work with the computer systems, a little bit of uh, knowledge could be dangerous. And so we got that up and running. And uh, then I figured, OK, need something better than that. So the summer after junior year, got a job for one of the banks down in Chicago. And that paid eight fifty an hour. Or was it six fifty? I think it was six fifty an hour. It was like, you know, it's still a slave wage. You figure 2,000 hours. A year, that's still 13 grand for doing applications development. And what they had is they had an installation of APL. And it ran their whole bond evaluation system where they bought and sold hundreds of millions of dollars of bonds for the biggest institutional clients. And what they were had is they were using a timeshare system up in t Toronto, and they wanted to transfer it to their own IBM because they finally saved up enough money at a bank to buy their own IBM 370. They wanted to pull it in locally. Problem was the dialects of APL were a little bit different. So this one you'd have a semicolon, but this one you'd have a comma. Well, this one you have this. And so what they had is they had three people on their bank working full time for the whole summer, translating all these programs from one to the other. Well, that seems pretty lame job, but hey, the money was good. You could ride the L in for 50 cents back and forth, and I needed the money. Well, first day on the job, I'm in there and I'm looking at it, and you're supposed to log in, you got ID and password, and I'm thinking like, well, you know, this is APL, I wonder how it works. So go poking around, and this thing said, to, to, oh, there you go. Well, there's the whole password file. It's supposed to be secured and locked up, but, you know, hacker, right? You know, you get into it. And so I printed it out, and I brought it in to see my boss, and, and she was away at lunch. So I just put a note on her desk, I'm going to lunch. Um, you know, we should probably do something about this. Come back from lunch, and there's a little note. Please see me. Here we go again. Uh, time to talk to the senior vice president. I, I think everybody in the bank is the vice president, right? The vice president of janitorial services, vice president of washing the windows. Well, anyways, I was like, well, you know, what's this? I said, well, you know, I'm on their staff and I'm, I do security stuff. I don't have really a job yet, but I kind of like to look at it. And our, your whole security system is wide open. And the guy said, we've been using the system for three years. We've never had a problem with it you know, that you know of. So fix that for them. So you, you kind of walk around with this you know, electronic screwdriver unscrewing people's bad security. And I said, but you know, another thing is on, I'm talking to you, Mr. Big. Um, and I'm here for the summer to work on this program, to re, you know, rechange all this stuff around you. Yeah, it's just very, very important. We need to get this in-house. I said, all these changes are very deterministic. That is, they don't change. You know, everything this goes to that. That could be done by a computer program. Uh, I can write a program to do the whole thing. And they kind of look at me. It's like, is this kid nuts or what? I, you know, don't let the unions find out about him. So they said, oh, well, see what you can do. All right. So I put together and I test around it. And I said, look, here we go. It'll run all night long. It was running at timeshare speed, but it will convert the entire program. And so we did that. And it worked. And did basically what was set aside about two man years worth of effort got done in one evening. <laughs> and now the bank likes me. <laughs> and they say, hey, Mark, uh, we'd like to make you an offer when you graduate next year. He said, well, that'd be great, except uh, I've already got a commitment. I said, well, that's okay. We all, we'll, we'll pay more than they are. I'm sure you'll pay me more, but I, I can't get out of the commitment. See, I'm a ROTC, and they're paying for my college. And so last summer, I had to sign a commitment that says four years of college equals four years at sea. And you really can't get out of that, I mean, at least not in this country, unless you want to move to Canada or something like that. And you just pull all your timeshare back from Canada. So this isn't going to work. So it was one of those things where a little bit like... Uh, 
you know, some great sports star going off to the military. Can't, you, know, you, you can't go into the NBA right away. Sorry, David, you've got to go out to sea for a couple of years. All right, well, you've got to go out and, and work on that. So had to say goodbye to all that. Northwestern was a pretty cool place. It was in Evanston, Illinois, home of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. 80,000 people, Big Ten College, no alcohol anywhere, legally. No bars, no taverns, no liquor stores, and no takeout food. This is for real. If you went down to the Burger King, which is the only fast food restaurant, they stacked the bags by the door. If you wanted a Whopper to go, you had to put it in the bag yourself because somehow that violated their puritanical sense of what was right or what was wrong. So the frats used to go ahead and throw all their money on, or throw all their beer bottles on the front lawn of the WCTU on Friday nights. And little blue hair saying, take out the glass, go away, go away. But I didn't get to participate in that. I was what they call a GDI, goddamn independent. People who absolutely refused to join a, a frat. And so we stayed you know, in the dorms. We, we finally moved out. So at that point, I said, okay, great. I'm off going to the real world. By the way, these little cards here, should we do another drawing real quick? What have I got? Anybody like Microsoft? How about a genuine Microsoft coffee mug? Ooh. Hey, Noy, did you take all those cards yourself? Yeah, he's wandered off. Well, uh, as they say, you've got to be present to win. So let's grab the next dollar bill here in the sequence. We'll see. See if people showed up. Well, anybody got number 072? It wouldn't be you, Pappy. You got one early. They went on the sequence. Okay, that's no good. Let's try another one. Number 035. Do you like Microsoft? I know. You do now, right? <laughs> this is metallic. It's heavy. I'm not going to throw it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just because it's him. Hey, wait. Hey, for the buddy sitting oh, next to you, yeah. give him his closet key. So anyway, I get off to the military and figure, okay, great. I want to go ahead and I've got to go to the Navy and you've got to do different things. So I thought, well, hey, submarines sound good, right? Not because you like the social life, but because you get a master's degree in nuclear engineering, it's really smart people, I don't know, that's a real elite force. Well, the problem was is that I had a chance of summer, one of the summer cruises where you go out to sea for a couple of days on a ship, you go out to sea on a submarine, they go let you fly a plane until you throw up, and all the cool stuff, you get to see what all your different career patterns are. It turns out on a submarine, none of the ceilings are greater than six foot two. And none of the bunks are great longer than six foot two. And I'm a little bit taller than that comes about here on me. And I remember talking to one of the senior chiefs on there who was standing watch one evening with me and he's saying, I'm six foot five and I've been in the submarine forest for twenty two years and it hasn't been a problem. And I had to have been about this much taller than him. The guy walked like this. <laughs> and I think that was a little bit scary. But then this submarine had just come back from 60-day patrol. They took us out for three days of midshipmen. And talking to the guy next to me, he's like, what's it like out there? Is the sun still shining? Is the grass still green? And I'm like, oh, you guys are a little bit weird. And I figured, well, okay, they may be smart, but they're not socially well-adjusted. Kind of like us, right? So I decided to go ahead and do what Navy people do, go on ship. I, didn't want to join, I, I thought it would be cool to fly, but I don't have 20-20 vision. And I have to fly back seat. And so all you want to do is like take off on an F-14, off the end of an aircraft carrier, rocketing away. You're up there about Mach one and a half. The guy in front of you goes, I just got a new John letter for my wife. I'm hating life. I don't want to live anymore. It's like, but I do. <laughs> but there's no stick back there. You don't have any control. So I said, okay, I want to go to California. I thought California would be pretty cool because I had never been outside of western New York growing up. My first plane flight was heading off to college in the great western part of America, Chicago, at Northwestern, right? We wouldn't have called it that if it wasn't all there. And that summer I ended up in Japan at a midshipman cruise. You take some little kid who's six foot four and 135 pounds, you put him in Japan, okay, and you know, like, oh, big guy, oh, big guy. He didn't fit anywhere. He got on the subways and the little advertising would hang down to here. And I remember, you know, just absolutely not fitting in over there. So I said, okay, I want to go to a non carrier combat. Non carrier meaning. You don't want to be an aircraft carrier because you get lost on there. Combat, you got guns. Okay, it's sexy. Go shoot things out of San Francisco because that looked like a cool city. Well, it turned out there are no non-carrier combatants out of San Francisco. There's carriers. There's non-combatants. So they said, okay, well, here, here's the closest thing. We're going to send you to the USS Mars. Okay. Um, and it's the designation is AFS-1. Well, what does that mean? I mean, car cruisers are like CG, you know, C for cruiser, G for guided missile, and CV for carrier. And then it's nuclear power, but AFS. And I look it up on the Jane's fighting ships. Like, what the heck is this thing? Combat store ship carries groceries and spare parts. <laughs> okay, great. I'm going to be on a TAC food ship. <laughs> and I actually had business cards printed up that said that, you know, the number one attack food ship probably presents G. Mark Hardy, vegetable officer, 
Uh, uh, USS Mars and says, you can whip our potatoes, but you can't beat our meat. <laughs> and politically incorrect, somewhere around the Western Pacific, there's a hundred of those cards stuck in bars, stuck on walls, you know, in various places and things like that. But hey, you can have fun back then. And uh, so, you know, I went out there. And back on those ships, your computers were water-cooled tube computers at best. Maybe they had some transistors in there, but there are actually no chips. And so all the fire control radars, everything like that, was run through saltwater cooling. Imagine that. It's like running a reactor. <laughs> and uh, things were pretty so. My summer cruise, the one I did as a midshipman, was on board one of the, the cruises out of uh, Japan. I mentioned I got out there. I remember one Friday, like a Thursday night or Friday night, went into the Combat Information Center, CIC, where you have all the radars and all the consoles, and it's all dark and little blue lights are on. Everybody's huddled over the console. It's like, wait, we're in port. What's wrong with these people? They should be out partying. I went over and took a look at it, and sure enough, someone had written an application to play Star Trek. And everybody with their little trackballs and their little monitors and all their little fire control panels are flying around the, the galaxy shooting Klingons <laughs> and blasting away on these big water-cooled computers. So my next ship I got to was, um, was USS Shenandoah, and uh, that was my second of the two ships. After that, I went into the reserves, mostly because I worked for a guy who was just really mean, really nasty, and I said, you know, I don't need to put up with this. You can't. It turned out that um, I wasn't the only one that felt that way, but occasionally you end up working for bad bosses. Uh, and in civilian life, you can usually just quit. In military, you can't just quit. So you've got to endure it. You've got to put up with it. But one of the cool things that came on that ship was our supply officer had just come back from the Naval Postgraduate School with a master's degree in computer science. And because it was a brand new ship built down here in San Diego, he had like this little special checkbook. Now you've got to understand, in the Navy, if a supply officer is not in jail by the time he's 40 years old, he's either, he's, not, you know, he's very, very good at what he's doing because a lot of these people tend to push the margin. And so anyway, he showed up and got this Alpha Micro 32-bit computer with these terminals throughout the whole, and I had one in my office because I was the operations officer and all the department heads had them. And we were the first networked computer ship in the United States Navy. And I thought, this rocked. And of course, they give you a little application menu. You have to stay inside the menu. And they always got mad at me because I was always getting shell prompt and <laughs> wandering around and just looking at it. And they actually like, you're not supposed to be doing that. So I'm like, oh, my work done. I said, well, you're not supposed to do that. Okay. I, don't, I, won't, I just don't get caught, right? But I did find some interesting things. They had, uh, for the master at arms, the police force, they had a random number generator so that when they did the urinalysis, it would come up with a random number from 1 to t 0, you know, 1 through 10, and that would be, okay, everybody whose social security number ends in 5, report down here for the, for the P-test. So I went down there one night, and I said, let me run this thing. And I get 0. Okay, well, let's run it again. 0. Let's run it again. 0. It kept using the same suit of random seed over and over again, so you got the same result. I said, okay, good sea lawyer could go ahead and get somebody off the hook by saying, you were really gunning for me because my social security number ended in zero. But again, bad programming early on. Well, one day, there's a knock at my door. Lieutenant, yes, um, we need to uh, take your computer. Oh, no, is the so mad at me? No, no, that's not it. Uh, we need to take your computer. Well, no, no, so we've got a couple of civilians here. They need to come with your computer. Well, what's going on? Let me talk to the supply officer. Well, he's right here. I'm like, Jim, what's going on? I don't want to, Jim, what the hell is going on? He says, it's getting repossessed. He says, repossessed? How do you repossess something from the military? He said, he had a special account when the ship was in the shipyard, and the ship shifted home port to the East Coast, and he figured the vendor would never find him, so he just stopped paying the bill. <laughs> they found him. So uh, we, had a, we had our computer systems repossessed, and so the first networked computer to be repossessed in the United States Navy. <laughs> But then after that, I decided I went out and I wanted to do computer security work. And I said, hey, I want to go to work with Fort Meade. And they said, you can't do computer security. I said, why? He says, the Navy has no need for computer security. <laughs> go back out to sea. This is 1984. And I go, no, seriously, I want to do this for a career. He says, you do that, you'll never make lieutenant commander. Kiss it goodbye. Well, hey, I like the Navy. Really want to do computer security. But I said I couldn't do both. So I said, well, how about if I get off active duty, go work and learn how to start a corporation in three years, I could hire people out of the National Security Agency instead of dead-ending my career there. So I did. That's how I got into the reserves, and that's why I started National Security Corporation, which I started two years and six months after I left active duty, and that's been my little consulting business that I've done all these years. And I haven't grown it past me, mostly because I've been happy doing the speaking and the consulting and things like that. And, you know, when you hire somebody, then you have all those commitments that come with it, which isn't bad, but I know within a year of hiring my first employee, I'll have 20. It just <laughs> off it goes. But it's nice having some independence. What you find out, though, is that I was talking 
before with Marcus Raynham. We were at a panel last year, and Marcus gave some recommendations in terms of jobs and careers. And one of the things he said is that pick out what you want. So if you want to be in management and you want to go run corporations, go do that. If you want to be technical, go do that. Don't try to do both. It's a recipe for disaster. Or it's a recipe for doing kind of what I turned out being, which is kind of a, a one-man show, which is nothing bad with that. A lot of independence, a lot of freedom, some good money. But I was there before Symantec was there. I was there before McAfee, long before anybody else. I was out in California looking for gold in 1838, saying there's gold up in the hills. And they go, yeah, yeah right. Because remember, if you're four or more steps ahead of everybody else, you're a lunatic. So that was interesting. And I thought that was, because I had my three-year plan to start a corporation, and it worked. Went to work for Booz Allen for a year and a half to learn how to be a blue chip consultant. Went to work for a little startup company in Connecticut, learn how to be an entrepreneur, then set up my own, my own shingle. But one of the things they find is that if you want to make yourself successful in life, if you want to do things well, it's, it's important you do some things. And I have five things I'd like to share with you. Number one, have a vision. We didn't have the vision back in high school. Bill Gates did. Steve Jobs did. Huge difference in outcome. Did okay, but those guys did spectacularly well. What's your vision for your life? Where do you want to be in 20 years? Where do you want to be when you're 50? Some of us are there, but for those who just got there, is this where you expected that you would be? Plan ahead, and if your vision doesn't match, or you don't have a vision, go get one. Lao Tse said, without vision, the people perish. And in leadership training that we do for the military, I was privileged to run the whole leadership training for the entire Navy Reserve for two years. And I was you know, the commanding officer of that whole thing. Pretty neat. But we teach people vision is a very important component of leadership that it helps inspire other people to achieve the goals that you set forward to them, and they want to go do that. But once you have a vision, you should have a plan. And not just any old plan, a written plan. Does anybody have a set of written goals for your life today? One, two, three, four. Have they been updated in the last year? One, two, three. Okay. The rest of us don't, me included. I need to update mine. It's been a while. During the times that my goals were written down, I had the best success, the fastest growth professionally, personally, emotionally, that I ever did because I was aiming for something. Otherwise, somebody else put something on and goes, well, that looks interesting. Well, that looks interesting. And you see, well, we spend our lives grabbing bright, shiny objects instead of going for what we really, really want to do. They did a study in Princeton many years ago, back in the 1950s, and they tracked these students all the way through till they were age 65. And they wanted to find out from them. They said, okay, who here has written goals? And 3% did. About 40 years later, when they had a chance, after they followed they through, they found 97% of the wealth was held by that same 3% incredibly disproportionate success in life if you take your goals and you commit them to writing. Take some risks. Be willing to jump away from the bi-weekly paycheck. Start something. You can always go back to, jump, to work. Why well, I want to start my company. I'm thinking, I don't want to let go of my paycheck. I don't want to go to the company. I want to go to the security. It's like hanging in a rope in a totally dark room and you can't see anything and someone says, let go of the rope and fall to the floor. And you're going, it's 30 feet, it's 50 feet, I'll, I'll be killed. And you finally go, that's it? Yeah. <laughs> you're about two inches off the ground the whole time? Yeah. In this business, you don't need to build a factory. You need a laptop and a box of business cards and maybe a haircut. And then you go out there and you do a consulting. <laughs> and after six months, if it doesn't work, then go back and get a job. But at least you had give it a try. So give it a shot. Be willing to take a risk and stay focused. Keep working on what your goals are. In life, we get a TTL, but it's a hidden field. We don't know when our TTL is going to hit zero. And I'm thinking here, okay, I'm 50 years old. Here's my official AARP card. How the hell do they know, by the way? <laughs> I mean, these partners are like, boom, right on, the, right on target. But, uh, yeah, what's your, what's your time to live? I'm thinking 50, okay, this is halfway. This is a half time, right? My buddy says, maybe it's a two-minute warning. <laughs> Maybe it's sudden death. Well, you don't know. You know how much time you got. We've all lost some friends. We lost some friends this past year. You know, we lost Jeff. Just uh, dropped dead. Uh, I guess massive heart attack. He's 41 years old, out running. Anybody knows Monkey? He won't be at DEFCON this year. You know, a couple of years ago, we lost one of our uh, friends from out there from our gun shoot. And Josh, who drove the big city bus that he bought off of eBay from the city of Los Angeles, not going to be there. So you don't know how long you got, so make, you know, give it a shot. And then lastly, determination. You will encounter obstacles. You will encounter people who say, you're nuts, you're crazy, that's not going to work. You can't do it. Never disqualify yourself. There's one thing you remember, never disqualify yourself. Other people will try. Apply for things you're not eligible for. Apply for things you're not senior enough for. That are more Because you never know, you might be the only one applying. Well, there's a house around the corner and you know, it's, it's 
It's way too much money, but they're in trouble. So bid in half price. Maybe they'll take it. I don't know. Don't be worried about being embarrassed about trying something and not succeeding. Failure is part of life. It's a way of measuring your ability to try things. If you're not encountering failure every now and then, if you're not trying hard enough, you're not pushing the envelope. Be willing to make mistakes. And lastly, a little bit of philosophy that I've come from that group here. I've never, you know, I, I've, you know this, this lady saying, are you a hacker? Well, let's face it. Albert Einstein hacked Newtonian physics, right? That's the whole idea of hacking, an intellectual pursuit of being able to produce an outcome that the designers of the system never intended. But you can't change the rules. You can't change the laws of physics. You can't change the way the chip works, but you're still going to come up with a result that's going to work. So we got some of the smartest people in America here, actually from around, from around the country, around the world. Got some friends here from Canada, too. Anybody from Europe? Okay, so you got one guy who came here farther than I did, two. But if you look around sometimes, you'll find they've never seen a bigger mismatch between financial success and intellectual ability than they have in the hacking community. I don't know why. Other than the fact that perhaps we're so good at living in cyberspace that we forget that it's a consensual hallucination, if you've ever read Neuromancer. It's not real. Did you ever dream about finding money? Money, wow, dollar bills laying around. That's, pretty, that's a cool dream, right? You find stuff laying around. Oh, here's some. Did you ever wake up with it in your hand? doesn't work that way. Internet's the same way. Unless you can translate it into the real world, it's just a hallucination. And I think that's the error we make, is we become so good at what we do in the system, we forget that the real network out there is carbon, not silicon. That we live among people, we live among humans, and like it or not, we created the networks, and we got to interact in that. So the things that you value in life, more than your collection of wares, more than your root kits, more than your zero days, should be the people in your lives. Because those are the irreplaceables. Those are the ones we haven't figured out a way to store to disk so you can boot them back up the next morning. Like that old Altair, at the end of the day, when you shut it off, the program died. People are the same way today. So care for the people who love you, care for those who are interested in you. They may not be here tomorrow. Uh, and then go out and enjoy your life. Take some challenges, take some fun, have a blast. Thank you very much. I got a couple other free giveaways, but if you want to applaud, you can. I can see you're like pulling up. <laughs> Who else likes Microsoft? Number 013. See, as long as no two people don't jump up, I'm not going to, okay, you're not worried about validation. What else we got is pretty good. Oh, yeah, by the way. <laughs> This, this T-shirt fit me in high school. <laughs> That's our APL. It's taking over shirt. Um, I, I got a couple other cool things here. Anybody like this guy? Kaminsky? <laughs> All right, let's see what we got here. Hey, Noid, how far do we get in the numbers? Can we go to the high numbers yet? We got like 94, but I don't know if we got 94 given out. Yeah, Noid's sitting in the, the whole pile. I'm in the corner. Zero 08? Going once? Nope. Doesn't work. Let's try another one. 46. 046. Gee whiz, would everybody walk out on you? Don't show this part on camera because the people are going to think that I walked out on me. 065. Random number generator. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Take care. Have a great day.